Our gracious and eternal Father, which art in heaven, this morning as we come before you, Lord, we see the fast fulfilling signs all around us. Lord, the signs that are taking place in the world, the earthquakes, uh, the pestilences, uh, Lord, the wars and rumors of wars. And then we also see the conflict within the church uh, that is transpiring even now. All of these are signs and indications that you're soon to come in the clouds of glory, but also as well that you are developing your children even now. And Father, we desire to be partakers of your divine nature. We desire that Jesus Christ would live within us. Mm -hmm. And so we ask and pray that as we begin this study, that you would be our guide, Lord, that Jesus Christ would be lifted up, uh, that many and all men might be drawn unto him. Lord, may we see the relevance of these things, and Lord, may ultimately uh, hearts and minds be moved and changed and converted. It's my prayer in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Well, this morning we're going to begin a study that uh, the Lord has just impressed upon my mind many months ago. And as I began to really understand these things uh, and look into them, <clears throat> I saw a great deal of, of, of information uh, dealing with the message, uh, the, the foundational message of today, the three angels message of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45. Um, we're going to be dealing with the closing scenes of the life of Christ. And in fact, we're going to be dealing with different aspects of the life of Christ. Uh, because as we look at this message, I believe that there's um, sometimes we overlook uh, an important aspect of the message. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, I mean that many of us or many people that look at this message and look at the charts and see these things, they look at the they see the child's zone. In other words, they see the complete and entire vision uh, but many miss the Mare vision, uh, and that is the vision of Christ. And as we see in the Bible and throughout the Bible, and we, we're going to take a look at that today, we're going to see very clearly how that all the prophets saw the vision of Christ. Now, notice what this particular statement says. We're going to read some statements, and we're going to look at some scriptures in the Bible as we continue to study in, uh, throughout the day. It says this. It says, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. Now we, hopefully all of us here and hopefully all of those who are watching believe in the spirit of prophecy. Do we all? Amen. Okay. When the prophet of the Lord says it would be well for us to spend an hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ, this is something that we should take to heart and mind. And she says, especially the closing scenes, we should take it point by point, his life, and we should go through each and every aspect of it. And we're going to understand by the grace of God why she tells us to do this um, as we look at this particular statement here. But she says we should really uh, allow the imagination to grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. It goes on to say, as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant our love will be quickened and we shall be more deeply imbued with his what? Spirit. Isn't that something that we're talking about? Amen. The latter rain. OK. What is the latter rain? It's the spirit of God. Correct. OK. And so the prophet of the Lord tells us here as we dwell upon his sacrifice, as we take his life scene by scene, point by point, specifically the closing scenes. She says that we will be more imbued with the spirit of God. It goes on to say, if we would be saved at last. Now, I know that's a goal of all each of us in here this, in this room and those who are watching as well. It says we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Now, it's interesting that that particular statement goes on to say it. In fact, she finishes out the chapter with this. I don't have this particular uh, the next paragraph after that. But it says, as we associate together, we may be a blessing to one another if we are Christ, our sweetest thoughts are up, will be of him. We shall love to talk of him and we will speak to one another of his love. Our hearts will be softened by divine influences. Beholding the beauty of his character, we shall be changed into the same image 
from glory to glory. She quotes 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 uh, at the, the paragraph directly after this particular paragraph. Is it necessary for God's people to be on one accord? It's vitally important for those who are preaching the message, specifically this final message, to be on one accord. And she says that as we behold the final scenes of the life of Christ, as we look upon his great sacrifice, as we learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross, that God's people will associate together, that they will love to speak to one another, that they will speak of his love and of his mercy and of his kindness and of his sacrifice. Now, what is the lesson of penitence and why do we need and humiliation? And we're going to answer that in just a few moments. But why do we need to take each scene point by point? Why do we need to look at the closing scenes? When we look at Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45, we see the rise of the man of sin. We see the rise of the papacy in the last days. And finally, we see him come to his end. We see uh, the mystery of iniquity uh, being manifested. But there's something that we don't see that's, that's there. I mean, it's there if you really dig it up and uncover it. But there's an aspect that we don't see that we need to understand and that we need to see. And what is that? When we look at the life or the closing scenes of the life of Christ, what we're going to see, hopefully, and by the grace of God throughout this presentation, is that the closing scenes of the life of Christ are the events of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45. We're going to see the rise of the king of the north. Okay? We're going to see uh, the son of perdition. We're going to see uh, the threefold union. We're going to see all of those things illustrated in the closing scenes of the life of Christ. They're all there. Everything is there that we see in Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 through 45. But what we're going to see and what Christ wants us to see as we look at his life and his sacrifice is the experience that God's people are to have while going through those scenes. Because if we look at Christ and how he dealt with each and every aspect of Daniel 11 verses 40 through 45, as we see Christ dealing with the threefold union, as we see Christ dealing with the church, as we see Christ dealing with all those different aspects, we see who we should be. Amen? Because Christ, remember, when is Christ going to come? When the Sunday law happens, when is Christ going to come? When his character is fully reproduced in his people. That's when he's going to come. So what we're going to see is we're going to see these events. But what Christ really wants us to see is, listen, I want you to see how I went through it so that you can go through it as well. How I endure these things, because the Bible says, in fact, let, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. And as I began to really study these things and really look at them, I, I saw something, brothers and sisters. I saw something very scary. And what I saw was that I'm not like Christ at all. I'm not like him. And that scared me. Why? Because in order to be saved, I need to be like him. I need to reflect his character. I need to have his love and his mercy and his kindness. I need to have all those things in my heart. And those things are not there. And we're going to see in the life of Christ how we as God's people should be and how we're to meet these things as we're living in these times, as we're living in the closing scenes of this earth's history. But we're in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verse Number, uh, let's look at verse number one. It says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a, or seeing, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that, which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How should we run this race? What does it say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now we're going to come back to this text, but I wanted just to look at this text confirming what we just read here, that she says that as we walk this pilgrim's pathway, as we're on the, um, the road to heaven, as we're on the narrow road, where are our eyes supposed to be fixed upon? On Jesus. 
That's what our eyes are supposed to be on. Our eyes are supposed to be fixed upon him. We need to learn something. She says there's lessons that we need to learn. What are these lessons? It says if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation. Where? At the foot of the cross. So day by day, where should we be coming? To the foot of the cross. Why? Why are we at the foot of the cross? To learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation. Now that word humiliation, that's a serious word, right? None of us like to be humiliated, do we? We don't like the, that, that even word coming out of our mouths. Humiliation, that, that seems like a bad thing, but this is a lesson that we as God's people are to be learning. Now, what does that word penitence mean? What does it mean? It means repentance, pain, sorrow, or grief of heart for sins or offenses, contrition, Real penitence springs from a conviction of guilt and ingratitude to God, it says, and is followed by amendment of life. So notice, penitence, the, one of the lessons that we're to learn is the lessons of penitence or repentance, a sorrow for sin, a turning away from sin, and also a uh, changing of the life according to what the definition for penitence is. The Bible goes on to tell us, or Sister White, as we look at the definition of humiliation, I want you to notice these things here. It says the act of humbling, the state of being humbled. Now, notice what the first definition is. It says descent from an elevated state or rank to one that is low or humble. So the first definition of humiliation is a descent from an elevated state or rank to one that is low or humble. Notice what your Bible says. Does God tell us to do these things? Yes, he does. In fact, notice what your Bible says in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're just opening up this study here. By the grace of God, by the end of this study, we're going to see, and I'm not just talking about this particular study, but by the end of our studies, we will see what we need to be doing as the people of God. Yes, we need to be studying. We need to be proclaiming the message, messages, uh, the third angel's messages throughout the world. But God wants us, our eyes, to be fixed upon him so that we can behold. By beholding, we, we can become changed into that same image. But we're in Philippians chapter 2, and let's begin in verse 1. Are we all there? Amen. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So here, Paul here is referencing the, uh, the consolation in Christ, uh, Christ and his love, his, his, his spirit. He says, listen, if, if Christ is in you, his spirit is in you. He says, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. It's very interesting, and I'll bring this out now because I don't know if we'll have a chance to get to this, but we also see that there's going to be a group of people on the earth that have one mind. Is that correct? The Bible tells us that not only God's people are going to have one mind, but there's a group of people that are even now confederating themselves in the book of Revelation. In fact, hold your finger there. Let's just turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And when you get there, amen. Revelation 17, and let's look at verse number, we'll begin in verse number 12. Revelation 17 and verse 12. And the Bible says these words, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but we receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have what? One mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And notice what these people who have one mind, notice what they do. It says, These shall make war with who? The lamb and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The Bible tells us here that there is a group of individuals who are of one mind, and those individuals that are of one mind, they're going to make war against this other group of people who should also be of what? One mind. But we can only be of one mind if the Spirit of God is living within us. 
if God's love is in our hearts. And I'm going to continue to say that, brothers and sisters. You see, because if you do not possess the love of Christ in your hearts. Now, I know what some of us may believe or think we uh, know the love of God is or is to be. But as we study these things, we're going to see, according to scriptures, what is God's love? And what does it mean to us? But also, what does it mean to be a, a, of one mind? Turn with me uh, to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians just real quickly here. We see that the world is going to come together against the people of God. We see that the world is going to have a uh, confederacy. Now, we know that there is no love in the world. They don't love one another. Uh, this is based upon getting rid of the people of God, establishing their own kingdom, their own religion. The Bible tells us here that in order to come together and to be of one mind as the people of God, notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all do what? Speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So being of one mind also means that we have to do what? Speak the same thing. We all have to be on one accord. The message that we give has to be solidified. It has to be together. We cannot be preaching different messages uh, as the people of God. There must be unity in the faith and unity in the spirit. But now turning back to Philippians chapter 2. This is why the emphasis that we place upon preaching these messages is so great. Because if we're all preaching a different message, well, then we're not of one mind. And we know that Christ, the Bible tells us that uh, there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. The Bible tells us here in Philippians chapter 2, going back there, God tells his people that they must be on one accord and of one mind. It says in verse 3, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let, uh, let each esteem other better than who? Themselves. You see what we're talking about here? It says, let each person esteem the other better than themselves. Isn't this what Christ told in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee? This is the principle that he was teaching here. But see, a lot of times, how is this connected to what we're looking at? Because we're looking at this, this, this statement where it says that we need to take into account the, the life of Christ. Notice what it goes on to say. We're going to connect these things here. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what kind of mind did Christ have? Well, Christ, did Christ esteem others better than himself? Yes, he did. Was he humble? Yes, he was. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. What is the first definition of humiliation? It's descent from what? An elevated state or rank to one that is low or humble. Did Christ humble himself? Yes, he did. And what did the Bible say in verse 5? It says, let this mind be in who? In us. As Christ humbled himself, what do we have to do as the people of God? We have to humble ourselves. The Bible tells us in the book of James, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. But this is something that maybe some of us are not familiar with. Maybe we're not humble like Christ is humble. Or maybe we don't know that we need to be humble. Or maybe we don't know that we're not humble. Some of us have a, a high concept or a high, uh, we have a high opinion of ourselves. Thank you. We have a high opinion of ourselves and a high opinion of what we know and what we can uh, show in the scriptures and what we can teach and all of these things. It's very interesting, brothers and sisters, that Christ, the God that I know, the God that I read about, when Jesus walked on earth, there was many things that he could have told mankind. But he told them, he said, listen, there are some things I can tell you now, but you're not ready to receive them yet. It's, it's not time for you to under, because if I were to tell you, guess what? You wouldn't receive them. 
because you're not ready to receive them. He recognized that the garden of the heart, the soil of the heart, had to be prepared for the seed of truth to be planted in it. And this is why Christ did many things and he, he illustrated many things through parables to his disciples and to humanity. The second definition of humiliation is the act of abasing pride or the state of being reduced to lowliness of mind, meekness, penitence, and submission. James chapter 4, let's just turn there real briefly here. Why do we need to understand these things? Why? Because... Spirit of Prophecy says that this is the lesson that we need to learn daily at the foot of the cross. We need to learn daily the lesson of penitence or repentance, sorrow for sin and humiliation. We need to learn daily that we need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And the Bible says that God will lift us up. He will exalt us when that time has come. But we're in James chapter four and we're going to be looking at verses six and seven. And then we're going to be looking at verse 10. It says these words. It says, ye have condemned and killed the just one. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Let me back up here. It says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth who? The proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Who does God resist? He resists the proud. Now we're going to be looking at that. That's very significant here, brothers and sisters. And why do I say that? Because what we're going to discover is Daniel chapter 11, and, and maybe, maybe some of us already know these things, but the message of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45, is the message of the everlasting gospel. It is the three angels' messages, okay? But also, that is the message of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, okay? What does is, what, what is Genesis 3, 15 say? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Right? Correct? Well, who is the seed of the woman and who is the seed of the serpent? There are two, two classes, correct? The seed of the woman are those who have the character of Christ or the image of Christ. The seed of the serpent are those who have the character or the image of who? Satan. Now, let me ask you this question. What is the image of Satan? What is his character? Pride. Self-exaltation. Gadol. Right? And what does the Bible say about the proud here? What does it say? It says God resisted the proud. God resists those who are proud. And this is why we're going to see all throughout the scriptures and even in the time of Christ that we're looking at, this is why the message could not be received by the people of God. For this reason, we're going to see that. It's because of the pride that they had. You know, it's very interesting to me that Christ tells, he turns and he looks and he tells the Pharisees in John chapter 8, and we're going to, we're going to study this out. He says to them, he says, listen, you are of your father who? The devil. Well, wait a minute. The Bible tells us that the 144,000, they have their father's name, what? Written in their forehead. So what was Christ saying about the Pharisees? What was he saying about them? That they had their father's name written in their forehead. Their father was not Christ. Their father was not God. They had the image. They had the, the characteristics. They had the... Uh, uh, likeness of their father, the devil. And we're going to look at that uh, later on this evening. But the Bible tells us here in James chapter 4 and verse 6, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 10, it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So, Definition number two is the act of abasing pride or the state of being reduced to loneliness of mind, meekness, penitence, submission. It's recognizing who you are as a sinner and coming before God and saying, Lord, I need to be humble. I need to repent of my sins. But then the last definition says abasement of pride or mortification. Can you think of somebody who was abased because of their pride? Anybody? Who was somebody that was abased because of their pride? Who was brought low because of their pride? Wasn't Nebuchadnezzar? Wasn't he brought low because of his pride? 
The Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, he gets up and he says, isn't this the great Babylon that I have built by the might of my power? Right? Right? Don't we as God's people do that sometimes? I want you to see something here real quickly. Notice, notice what your Bible says. Let's, let's read that in Daniel chapter 4. We're just, once again, seeing why God is, is having us to understand or why he's telling us that we need to understand uh, or become familiar with the closing scenes of the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Why? And he tells us that this is so important that we need to do it every single day for an hour. He says you need to take an hour out of your day and you need to spend time exclusively taking each scene point by point through the life of Christ, especially the closing ones. It goes on to say, we're going to look at some more statements dealing with that in just a few moments. But we're in Daniel chapter 4 and we're going to be looking at verses 30. We'll begin in verse 30. Are we all there? Amen. amen. It says the king spake and said, is this is is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom? It says by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And it says, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will. I want you to notice that we have the pride of Nebuchadnezzar here. And as a result of his pride, he's what? He's abased. He's caused to do what? Wrong with who? The beasts. The beast of the field, correct? Now, we're going we're gonna to come back to this a little bit later. But turn with me in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6. So I'll turn there very quickly. Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten the words of God through, this, through his servant Daniel. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, God has given you this, this kingdom. God has, has, has given you all these things. You have not done these things yourself. But Nebuchadnezzar, he had gotten to a point where he said, listen, this is the great Babylon that I have built by the might of my hand, the might of my power. Notice what your Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is a warning that God gives to us as his people. Notice what he says to us here. We're in verse 11. Are we all there? In fact, let's back up to verse 10. It says, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to get thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, nor vine and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then do what? What's that next word there? Beware lest thou, what, forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So notice, God is speaking to the children of Israel here, but he's really speaking to us. And he says, listen, beware lest when you, you receive all of these gifts from me that you don't become high-minded and forget me. Now notice what it goes on to say. We'll continue to look here. It says in verse 13. It says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shall swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Going down, in fact, skipping down to verse, let's look in verse uh, 21. It says, Then Thou shalt say unto thy son, where we were in Pharaoh's bombing in the house of Egypt, and with a mighty hand, it says, with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, it says, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out thence, that he might bring us into, give us this land, which he swore unto our fathers. Now this is in reference to God basically talking to his people, uh, telling them that when your children shall ask you, 
uh, what mean these things or what means the Passover. He says, tell them about how God had given you this land. But Christ warned them. He said, listen, beware lest you forget. In fact, turn to chapter 8 for me. This is, this is uh, what I wanted to look at here in chapter 8 and verse 11. Chapter 8 and verse 11. Notice what it says here. It says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. It says, in fact, when you back up to verse 10, it's, it's speaking of the same thing that chapter 6 was talking about. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. It says, Beware, lest thou forget the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied. Verse 14, what does it say? Then thine, what? Heart be what? Lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He says, listen. Be careful because if you forget, what happens? Your heart becomes what? Lifted up. Now, does the Bible speak of anybody's heart who was lifted up? Satan. Who? Satan's heart, correct? Now, notice what it goes on to say. Notice what it says. It says in verse 14. Let's look in verse 14. It says, Then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water. It says, Who brought thee forth water out of a rock of flint, who, fled, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, whose power? My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Do we see the same thing that happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Who did God say did this for Nebuchadnezzar? God said, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, I've given you this kingdom. Okay? But what did Nebuchadnezzar say a year later? Isn't this the great Babylon that I have built? By the might of my power. You see, this is why God tells us, how often are we to do this? How often, brothers and sisters? A thoughtful hour each day. Each day we're to learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation. Every single day we have to learn this lesson. Why? Because we are in danger of repeating the same thing. And I'm going to tell you how in just a few moments here. But notice... God tells his people, listen, God has given you, God gave you this land. He's blessed you with all these things. But if you forget, guess what happens? Your heart becomes lifted up. And what do you say? You say, just as Nebuchadnezzar did, look at what my power did. I did these things, right? Well, brothers and sisters, how does that, how does that, how does that, how is that relevant to us today? Has God blessed us with light? Has he blessed us with the little book? Is he feeding us with abundant truth today? Yes. yes, he is. And many of us have a tendency of forgetting where this food came from. Where is it coming from? And what happens when we forget where it comes from? Our heart becomes what? Lift it up. And we say, well, listen, this, this is my message. I believe these things. You, you don't have these truths. This is my truth. Who are you? you? You don't know these things. And we become puffed up and proud in that which we know, not for, forgetting that God delivered us out of the house of bondage. He deliver, delivered us out of darkness. He's the one that gave us this light. And what has God called us to do with the light? He's called us to, to give it to others. As freely as ye have received, freely give. This is what God tells us to do with these things. The Bible says, as we continue to read here, let's move forward. Notice what this particular quotation says. And let's turn to the book of Hebrews. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews. I want to look at a few more things here. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> We're going back there.
This statement here says, in fact, let me back up. Notice what this says here. It says his ministry was nearly completed. He had only a few more lessons to impart. And that they might never forget the humility of the pure and spotless Lamb of God, the great and efficacious sacrifice for man uh, humbled himself to wash the feet of his disciples. We're going to be looking at that in, in probably in our next presentation. It says, it will do you good and our ministers generally frequently to review the closing scenes in the life of our Redeemer. Here, beset with temptations as he was, we may all learn lessons of the utmost importance to us. It will be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day reviewing the life of Christ from the manger to Calvary. So here we have a second witness to the statement in Desire of Ages. A thoughtful hour upon the life of Christ. Uh, important lessons, utmost important lessons. And like I said, when we look at the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes, we see the message of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45. We see the everlasting gospel. We see the three angels' messages contained in the closing scenes of the life of Christ. And that's what we're going to be dealing with. But Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, we're going to be looking at these scriptures here. And notice what your Bible says. Why does Christ tell us that we need to go to the cross every single day to learn these lessons. Why do we need to go to the cross? What, what is it that we see on the cross of Christ? What do we see? What do we see there? We see the death of Christ, Him dying for our sins, yes. What else do we see though? What, what is Christ showing us? Because in reality, brothers and sisters, as Christ went through the closing scenes of His life, and if those closing scenes are connected with the events of the close of probation, then who is Christ represented as uh, up on the cross? Who is Christ represented as? His people. Remember, those that in Revelation 17, those that had one mind, they go to make war with the Lamb, correct? Well, who, are they making war against Christ in Revelation 17? No, they're making war against His people, okay? So those that are represented on this cross, we know that as we come to Christ, we're, 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 we, we, we come to the foot of the cross in sorrow for sin, for repentance, uh, and humiliation for the things that we have done. But Christ wants us to see his character. Why? Because as we're, we're put on the cross, if you will, as we're persecuted, as we deal with these things, we have to, we have to be what he was. And what was he? What does he want us to see in his great sacrifice? Notice what it says here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we, are all, seeing we also are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now I want you to notice, the Bible says that Jesus endured the cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame. What was it that Jesus endured? What did he endure? What did he endure? Was it, he endured the cross, yes, yes. That's what it says. The shame of the cross. What does the Bible say that Jesus endured? He endured the cross, but notice what your Bible says in the book of Matthew. I want you to, I want you to see some things here. Because if we locate and we, we look at what, we're going to Matthew chapter 20. If we identify what Jesus endured, then we will identify what we have to endure. Okay? We will understand the things that we will have to undergo or partake of. Notice what it says here. We're in Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to be looking at verse 18. Matthew 20 and verse 18. Are we all there? Jesus is speaking here. He says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. What is the first thing that Christ had to deal with? He was betrayed, was he not? He was betrayed unto 
the chief priest. Now, who betrayed him? One of his own disciples. One of his own disciples. Jesus had to deal with the betrayal of one of his own followers, one of those who was closest to him. Jesus had to deal with that betrayal. That was something that he had to endure. How did Jesus endure that trial? How did he, how did he get through that? Was he upset? Was he angry? Was he revengeful? How did he endure that? The Bible says that Jesus, as we just read right, right here, it says the great and efficacious sacrifice for man, he humbled himself. And what did he do? He washed the feet of his disciples, even this one right here, the one who, who was betraying him. You see, that took something that we do not possess. We do not humanly possess that trait of character. That does not live within our hearts because naturally we're proud. We're not humble. And if we know that somebody is doing something dirty to us, I mean, we know that they're, they're stabbing us in our backs. We know that they're betraying us. Either we have one of two attitudes. We either say, hey, listen, I'm, we, we treat them bad. We, don't, we, don't have any, we, we, we just write them off. Every time that we see them, we, we, we don't have anything to do with them. Or we just, we, we don't say anything. We just silently cut them off. And we treat them as though they have leprosy or cancer. But we see Christ here, our Redeemer, our Savior, what does he do? He kneels down in the closing final scenes of his life and he washes that individual's feet. That's the love of God. What does the Bible say that we need to learn at the foot of, of the cross? Humiliation. Humility. And he was being betrayed into the hand of the chief priest. Now we know that the chief priest, this was the church. This, these were the individuals who were his people, right? In our next presentation, we're going to deal with uh, what the Bible says that he came unto his own. And how does the Bible say his own received him? They didn't receive him. This is the message of John. This is the message of William Miller. This is the message of the 145. This is the message of the little book. God comes unto his own people, but his own people don't even recognize him. They don't receive him. But here Christ, he's betrayed into the hands of the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. He should die. It says in verse 19, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. So do we see a process here? We see those that are closest to him deliver him into the hands of the chief priests and the elders. Then we see the chief priests and the elders handing him into the hands of the Gentiles. Isn't that how it's going to go? You're going to have those who were once standing upon this message of present truth, who are side by side with us, proclaiming the same truths that we're proclaiming, who are going to betray us into the hand of the church. That's what it says here. This is not something I'm making up. This is what the Bible is saying here. And then it says that they will then, they will then put you in the hands of the Romans, the Gentiles, and deliver you to be killed. But what does Christ want us to see? Notice, what it fin we'll, we'll finish this text out here in verse 19. It says, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Christ was, he was telling this to who? His disciples, correct? How did his disciples react to this? How did they react to it? How did they react to Christ saying this? They were blind, yes. But what, remember Peter's reaction? Peter says, no, no, Lord. No, no, you're, you're, you're not going to have to go through these things. I, I rebuke you, right? We're not going to have to suffer those things. You're not going to have to do that. But Christ says what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Christ recognized where this pathway was leading. Okay. And how did he deal with it? The Bible tells us, in fact, let's turn to the, to the book of John. Let's turn to the book of John. One of the things that I'm seeing, brothers and sisters, and I don't have any problem admitting it. 
I need to be humble. I need to have the humility of Christ. As God's people, as we deal and go through these things, we have to be humble before God. And we have to say, Lord, as I'm preaching these messages, as I'm giving this truth, let it be out of a burden for souls and not because I'm just trying to put this in the people's face. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let it be because I'm trying to win my brethren and not because I have some ulterior motive. Because Paul talked about how there would be false uh, shepherds and, and, and wolves that would come among the peoples and they would be doing what? Why, why would they be doing these things? To draw away people after themselves. That was their motive. Now, and that's what I'm saying with us. We have, to, we have to, Lord, what are my motives? Because the Bible tells us that our motives, we don't even know our motives. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Bible says our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We don't even know who we are. And that's why we need to go to God and we need to say, Lord, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. The Bible says in John chapter 12 in verse 27, notice what it says here. It says, now Christ, this is Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to look at this experience in its detail uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Because this is an experience that we're going to have to go through and deal with. We're just reading this now in, in, in context of what we're looking at. But it says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But what does it say? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus says, listen, Father, if you can take this from me, take it from me. But this is why. This is the purpose that he what? He came into the world. The cross the experience that he was going through, that was the purpose that he came into the world. And not only that, but it was to show us how we're to make it through that time. How my people, because my people are going to have to endure this. Christ says, if they've done it unto me, they shall do it unto you. The servant is not greater than his master. So we're going to have to understand how did Christ do it? And he did it with great humility. He did it with great patience. He did it with great love for those who were trying to kill him and those who eventually delivered him up into the hands of the Gentiles. The Bible tells us back in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, Christ endured many things. We're going to look at some of those trials and what he endured as we continue to study. But going back to Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to look at a few more scriptures and a couple of more quotations, and then we'll just pick it up and we'll, we'll go through these. We'll continue to just walk through these particular presentations here. Uh, it says in verse 3, it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. What is something else that Christ endured? He endured the contradiction of what? Sinners. He endured the contradiction of sinners, the Bible says. And that word contradiction, you know what it means? It means hostility. Hostility. How are you in the face of hostility? Are we cool? Are we, you know, how do we deal with hostility when somebody steps on our foot? When somebody presses our button, the Bible says that Christ endured that. He went through it. And there was no, there was never a thought or emotion in the mind of Christ of retaliation. Never. It did not exist. It was not there. It the thought never came up because if it did, brothers and sisters, Christ could not be our perfect sacrifice. So Christ subdued, he subdued his humanity. And this is, why, this is why the Bible says that we must be partakers of what? The divine nature. We have to be partakers of the divine nature. Because if we're not, we cannot be overcomers. We cannot overcome the sin that is, 
and, 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 and the trials that are just ahead of us. The Bible says, consider him that endures such hostility or contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and fainting your minds. It says, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. This is telling us, guess what? That what Christ went through, we're going to have to go through. His trials, his tribulations, what he endured upon this earth, every follower of God, if we're going to make it into the kingdom, and especially us, those who are living in these last days, we're going to have to endure what Christ endured. But in order to endure that, what does it say we need to do? We need to look at Jesus. Because by beholding, number one, you see that you're nothing like that. And guess what? All the prophets had this experience. Did you know that? All of them saw the Mare vision, or they saw Christ. They saw him. And when they saw him, what did they do? What was their experience? They fell at his feet. I'm a man, I say, I'm a man of un, unclean lips. Unclean, I, I, I can't, I can't, do, Lord. That's his, his response when he saw God is he, he fell on his face. Lord, I can't do this. Notice what your Bible says here. No, let, let, let's, let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 6, real quickly. Isaiah chapter 6. This is the experience. That all the prophets had. Ezekiel had it. Jeremiah has it. Daniel. John, the revelator, has it as well. The Bible tells us here, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, In the year of King Uzziah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And it goes on in verse 5, just skipping down to verse 5, it says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So as he saw Christ, he saw that he was undone. As we behold the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we will see the same thing. We'll see the same thing. We will not be able to lift our heads before God. Why? Because we will see his glory, his beauty, and we will see that we're nothing like who he is. Now, the other thing that we see on the cross, brothers and sisters, in fact, notice what, notice what your Bible says. In fact, let's go to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. 33. This is the other thing that we see on the cross of Christ. Exodus chapter 33. Why the closing scenes? Why the cross of Christ? There's a lot that we need to learn. And this, 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 this statement here says there are lessons. We may all learn lessons of the utmost importance to us. Okay. It says here in verse 18... We all know this story here. It says, and he said, I beseech thee. This is Moses speaking to God. What? Show me thy glory. Now, when we go to chapter 34 and God basically declares the glory of God or, or shows his glory, he, 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 um, he proclaims the name of the Lord God. Notice what it says in verse 6. It says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and that will, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. Is this not what was seen upon the cross? Was the glory of God seen upon the cross of Calvary? Was it? Yes, it was. In fact, we'll read a statement where Sister White says that the glory of God was seen upon the cross of Calvary. Well, what's the glory of God? The Lord. The Lord God. What? Merciful. Gracious. Do you see God being merciful and gracious? Long-suffering. Abundant in goodness and truth. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. 
Do you see him by no means clearing the guilty? Yes, because that's why Christ was on the cross. The guilty could not be, they could not be overlooked. And so Christ had to pay the ultimate price. We see the glory of God illustrated on the cross of Calvary. We see the humiliation, the humility of Christ, and we see the lesson of penitence all there illustrated at the cross of Calvary. And this is something that we need to understand. This is something that we need to look at day by day as we are walking with our Lord. Notice as we wind this down, it says these things, these final statements here. It says, those who would gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of what? Self-sacrifice. How important is sanctification? Without it, the Bible says, you, you can't see God. Okay? You, you can't be saved without being sanctified. So, those who would gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. Where does it say we learn this? And it says the cross of Christ is the central pillar on which hangs far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. If any man will come after me, Christ says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and do what? Follow me. It says it is the fragrance of our love for our fellow men that reveals our love for God. It is patience in service that brings what? Rest, rest to the soul. What is, what is the rest? Refreshing. refreshing. What is the refreshing? It's a lot of rain. Okay. You see, all of these things go together, brothers and sisters. We're, we're, <laughs> what I'm attempting to do here by the grace of God and through these presentations is to show that these messages that we're, we've been hearing all along are tied into everything. Okay. They're not separated from the message of uh, uh, righteousness by faith. and It's the same message. It's all one. Okay? It's all the same message. We see here that self-sacrifice, which is on the cross of Christ, that this is the rest. It is patient service that brings rest to the soul. What was Christ? What was he? We read it in Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself and became a servant. As God's people in these last days, what are we to be? Servants. Servants to who? Servants to God? Yes, but servants to who? Our fellow men. And in order to be servants to our fellow men, we must learn the meaning of what? Self-sacrifice. Self because guess what? Just like those disciples in the upper room, as Christ, as they all sat there, they were all looking at each other like what? Well, who, 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 who's going to get up and uh, where, where's the person that to wash the feet here? Right? I'm not doing that. Right? The humility was not there. The love of Christ was not there. They had not received the spirit of God. They had it. Spirit of God was not in them. We're, we're going to see that as we continue to study. It said it is through humble, diligent, faithful toil that the welfare of Israel is promoted. It says God upholds and strengthens the one who is willing to follow in Christ's own way. This is Prophets and Kings, page 590. It says, in the time of the end, the people of God will sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. That's Ezekiel chapter 9. It says, with tears, they will warn the wicked of their danger in trampling upon the divine law. That's Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. Okay. It says, and with unutterable sorrow, they will humble themselves before the Lord in penitence. So they will have an experience with God themselves. The wicked will mock their sorrow and ridicule their solemn appeals. Didn't we just read about that? They, they, they delivered Christ up to be mocked, to be persecuted, to be scourged. Okay. In the time of the end, the wicked will mock their sorrow, those who do all of these things, okay? Those who have uh, uh, yielded their time and their, um, their hearts to the Lord to do service for Him. It goes on to say, the wicked will mock their sorrow and ridicule their solemn appeals, but the anguish and humiliation of God's people is unmistakable evidence that they are regaining the strength and nobility of character lost in consequence 
of sin. I want you to notice this. What is the evidence that they're regaining that which was lost? Remember, the Bible says uh, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, right? What was lost? What was lost? Eternal. Eternal life. When we go back to the Garden of Eden, what was lost? The image of God in man. That's what was lost. And that's what we're trying to get back, correct? So the image of God in man is that which was lost. We're trying to gain that image back. But what is evidence that we're regaining that image? It says, but the anguish and humiliation of God's people is unmestakable evidence that they are regaining the strength and nobility of character lost in consequence of sin. It is because they are drawing near to Christ, because their eyes are fixed on His perfect purity, that they discern so clearly the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Meekness and lowliness are the conditions of success and victory. A crown of glory awaits those who bow at the foot of the cross. In this message, Christ says, listen, one of the things that we're seeing, brothers and sisters, I, I, make no mistake, we're seeing the dates, we're seeing the events, we're seeing how all these things tie together. And by the grace of God, we're going we're gonna to see that Christ, Christ is the center of the 2520. He is. In fact, in fact, I'll, I'll say this on camera here and I'll say this to you. But the 2520 is on the 1863 chart. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'll show it to you. It's there. I'll show it to you. And people can't argue that. Okay? When you see it, you'll see it and be like, oh, yeah, there it is. It's there. It's on there. But only if, if, if like I said, when you really understand the heart of the message, then you'll, see, you'll be able to point it out on the chart. It's there. Because the heart of everything is what? It's Christ. It's Christ. Well, I'm going to show it. I'm going to put the, put, the, put, put the chart up and we'll, we'll see it. It's there. But Christ is at the center of everything that we teach. And one of the things that we need to learn how to do as God's people is show it. Because as we show it, as we present Christ as, you know, as, I mean, Daniel 11, yes, it's the rise of the papacy. But what, what is it really about? It's really about how God is separating two classes and God is, is developing his people. In his people, the image of him. He's restoring that which was lost. Also as well, just as God is stamping his character in mankind, Satan is doing the same thing as well. He's doing the same thing. Because remember, there's two classes. Satan is molding mankind in his image, and God is doing the same thing as well. That's what we need to show the people. Yes, the papacy is rising. Yes, the Sunday law is coming. But what you need to understand is that God is developing his people. And we're going to see, by the grace of God, it's interesting that a lot of things that, that Jeff has been talking about last night and, and, and just this morning, uh, I was like, man, I was really getting excited because these are some things I'm going to be dealing with. In fact, the daily, uh, what, he, what he stated that he was going to be dealing with, I'm, I'm going to deal with that a little bit tonight. Hopefully I don't step on his toes, but if I do, well, you know, uh, maybe he'll, it'll just be a redundant presentation. But we're going we're gonna to be looking how the daily, in and of itself, is Christ. Christ is the center of the daily. Okay? We need to understand how to put these things together and how to fit them uh, one with another. As we close here, just reading this last line once again, it says, Meekness and lowliness are the conditions of success and victory. A crown of glory awaits those who bow at the foot of the cross. At the very beginning, Desire of Ages 83, she says, we should take uh, each scene point by point, specifically the closing ones. She says, we need to come to the foot of the cross and we need to learn the lessons of penitence and humiliation. Uh, by the grace of God, this is counsel that we will not overlook anymore. Uh, yes, it is a good thing to, to study these things, but brothers and sisters, if we can understand, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, or verse 2, we can understand all mysteries and have all knowledge and understand all prophecies. But if we don't understand who we're to be, and how are we, how are we to understand who we're to be? Looking at Christ, by beholding Christ. If we don't understand that, if we don't understand how Christ wants us to be in the closing scenes, 
If we don't understand who we're to be as the rise of the papacy is happening, as the king of the north is coming, as these events are taking place, then we've missed the boat. We're not on the boat, brothers and sisters. Because those things will, those things will happen, they will transpire, and guess what? We won't be ready. And we, we, we'll be like that man who was preaching the message in Jerusalem, but guess what? He, 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 was, he got killed. I'm talking about 70 AD, the man who was going up and down in Jerusalem. We'll be like that individual. Okay. So, by the grace of God, through these scenes and through our continued studies, we will continue to see uh, Christ at the center of this message by His grace. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be able to come before your cross and each day confess and forsake my sins. And Lord, to ask for the power that I need to be an overcomer and to be like you. Father, we recognize that more than anything else, we need to be like Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to see, anoint our eyes with eyes salve, that as we look at these messages, as we look at the experience of your people in these time periods, may we see how you desire for our characters to be and how we're going to make it through these times. I pray that you will strengthen us through your spirit, I pray that you would help us to not be fearful, but Lord, help us to take courage and strengthen us for that which is ahead. Lord, I thank you once again for all that you have done for us, and I pray that you will continue to be with us as we study today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.